It's pretty crazy to think that all energy on Earth originates from this big fusion reactor 94 million miles away. Energy today seems abundant, if not infinite. It's easy to overlook where it all comes from. Whether we're burning wood to keep warm, or burning fossil fuels to generate electricity, these energy sources can all be traced back to the sun. It has been said that humanity had to burn 100 million years worth of trees just to get everyone plumbing. While this may or may not be true, the fact is that fossil fuels have allowed humanity to make leaps and strides in technologies that have increased our standards of living across the board. By tapping into Earth's fossil fuels, we gain access to hundreds of millions of years worth of stored energy. This energy is the result of ancient plants and animal remains, who in a very distant past were inhibiting Earth's surface, absorbing energy from the sun and storing it in chemical bonds. In the presence of sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide, plants are able to store energy in the form of glucose through a process called photosynthesis. Over geological timescales, these plants and other lake-dwelling organisms turn into coal and petroleum, which can then be extracted from the Earth. In a sense, we can think of fossil fuels as an energy storage device, much like a battery, except the time it takes to recharge fossil fuels is in the millions of years. If our collective energy consumption exceeds the amount of energy stored in fossil fuels that are available at timescales relative to human lifetimes, we will be forced to change our habits and come up with new ways of obtaining energy. I enjoy working with electronics both professionally and as a hobby. My motivation for taking my lab off-grid is to assure that I will always have a means for my hobby and profession. Additionally, it will be comforting to know that I have a way of producing and storing my own energy in the event of emergency situations. To begin this journey, I bought four 100-watt solar panels from Amazon. These panels cost about $1.25 per watt. Solar panels have advanced quite a bit over the years, and they're becoming cheaper and more efficient as each year passes. Additionally, solar panels generally come with a 25-year warranty, meaning that if your panels were to produce less than 80% of their advertised output within that 25-year time frame, the manufacturer will replace them. Let's run some initial tests. Here are the panels leaning up against a south-facing fence. Leaning them against a fence at this angle is not ideal. I really just did this out of convenience. When I place these panels on my roof, I will likely see an increase in output. I've connected a load to these solar panels and put a shunt resistor in series. This shunt resistor allows me to measure the voltage drop across it, which is directly proportional to the amount of current being provided by the solar panels. I'm also measuring the output voltage of the panels, and with both of these measurements combined, the output power can be calculated throughout the day. Here I have a data logger running a program that takes a voltage and current measurement every 30 seconds. I am capturing this data from sunrise to sunset. I've taken this data into Excel and plotted it to get a sense of what these panels are capable of producing over the course of a day. Even under these non-ideal conditions, 400 watts worth of solar panels are producing almost 2 kilowatt hours worth of energy in a single day. To give some context to what 2 kilowatt hours of energy means, I've taken a power meter around various devices throughout my house and measured their consumption. For example, a washer will consume about 300 watt hours per cycle and that's using cold water in a large load configuration. A large fridge and freezer will consume about 1.75 kilowatt hours over the course of 24 hours. A mini freezer over the same time period will use about 500 watt hours. A PlayStation 4 with a TV will consume about 200 watt hours. And making a full pot of coffee with a standard coffee maker will also consume about 200 watt hours worth of energy. Building up a solar array capable of producing the energy demands of a single family home is probably cheaper than you'd think. Where I live in Nevada, the break-even point for going full solar with a grid-tied inverter is somewhere around seven years. Grid-tied solar systems are by far the most economic, as utility companies will pay you for the energy generated by your solar panels that you don't use. The problem with grid-tied systems is that in the event of a grid-down situation, you won't be able to use any of the energy generated by your panels. This is because all grid-tied inverters are designed to stop working once they detect a loss of grid voltage in order to protect utility workers who are trying to bring the grid back up. The other option is to go off-grid, which means you'll need an off-grid inverter, and a means of storing energy so that you have power when the sun isn't shining. This brings us to the main problem with solar, which is that it can only produce energy during the middle of the day, when the peak energy demand for most people is in the early morning and late evenings. The remedy to this problem is storing the energy in batteries. This is a 100 amp hour lithium iron phosphate battery. It has a nominal output voltage of 3.2 volts. Lithium iron phosphate chemistries are appealing for home energy storage for two big reasons. 
safety, and longevity. These batteries can easily last for 2,000 cycles or more, meaning that they can last for decades. The lithium iron phosphate chemistry is said to be more stable than the traditional lithium ion chemistries that contain nickel and cobalt. The idea is to take many of these cells and configure them in series and parallel to make a battery pack that can then be used to feed an inverter to generate the alternating current we are used to seeing in our homes. I will be using the Electrodacus BMS. It is an open source battery management system that has been designed for off-grid solar applications. The Electrodacus comes with a ribbon cable that you are supposed to tear apart and attach to each cell for monitoring and balancing. Not only do I not like how this looks, I also think it increases the chances of connecting a lead to the wrong cell. So I will be designing a printed circuit board with a mating connector for this BMS. My idea is that I can design a PCB to have large plated through holes that can be bolted down on the anode and cathode lugs of each battery. In the center will be the mating connector for the BMS, and I will place a fuse in series with each balance lead to protect the PCB's traces from blowing up if the pins on the connector were ever to be accidentally shorted. Next, I'm creating a box to put each of the cells into. I'm starting with an 8S1P configuration for now, but I plan on expanding this to 8S2P or 3P in the future. All of the series connections will be made with copper bus bars, and my BMS interface board will be installed on top. Once everything has been bolted down, I can install the BMS and hope that nothing blows up. Looks like my PCB is correct. A battery management system is an essential component for rechargeable battery packs. While it allows you to monitor the state of your battery pack, its primary function is to assure that the battery stays within safe operating zones during charge and discharge. The BMS is also responsible for keeping the series connected cells charge balanced relative to one another. The Electrodacus BMS can be configured for many different cell chemistries. As you can see, I've got this one set up for an 8S lithium iron phosphate battery with a capacity of 100 amp hours. Many other parameters can be tweaked that will govern how your battery will charge and discharge safely. The BMS is also responsible for enabling and disabling the charge controller that is charging the batteries and the inverter which is draining the batteries. It is able to do this through configurable digital outputs. Now that I have a functioning battery pack, it's time to test its capacity. I've charged it to full, and I am discharging it through my inverter by running a blow dryer. The BMS will disable the inverter once a cell has dropped below 2.8 volts for a set amount of time. This 2.4 kilowatt hour battery pack was able to provide 2.1 kilowatt hours worth of energy. This sounds about right when you account for the efficiency of the inverter, and I could also tweak my BMS settings to allow for slightly more discharge and get the output closer to the rated 2.4 kilowatt hours worth of energy. Now it's time to install the charge controller and the inverter. I chose to mount these locally in my lab as I didn't want to rewire my main electrical panel in the event that I decide to move out of this house. First I'll be mounting the charge controller. The charge controller is responsible for delivering the current generated by the solar panels to the batteries. There are many different styles of charge controllers available such as on-off, PWM, or MPPT. I chose to go with an MPPT controller, but in hindsight this may have not been such a good idea for reasons that I'll explain later. MPPT stands for Maximum Power Point Tracking. Solar panels have an IV curve that is dependent on iridescence and temperature. As these environmental factors change, so does the maximum power point for the solar array. To achieve maximum efficiency from your solar panels, a DC to DC converter that is controlled by a maximum power point tracking algorithm can be put between the solar panel and the load in order to present the solar panel with an optimum input impedance for maximum power transfer. This all sounds well and dandy, however, MPPTs are significantly more expensive. They're also much more likely to fail when compared to a PWM controller. If you compare the gained efficiency against the cost to replace one of these controllers, buying an additional panel and and using a PWM controller starts to look much more appealing. The only instance where you will definitely want an MPPT is when you are grid tied. The extra efficiency provided by maximum power point tracking will earn you more money as you sell energy back to the grid. In off-grid applications with limited battery capacity, having an MPPT simply means that you'll charge your batteries 10 to 20 minutes sooner than you would have with a PWM controller. Next is the inverter. The inverter's sole purpose is to convert direct current into alternating current. 
I oversized this inverter for my present use case for two reasons. One is that operating at or near the rated output will generate a lot of heat and cause the fans to run continuously. And two, because I wanted some overhead to grow into rather than having to buy an entirely new system when I wanted to expand. There are many inverters on the market to choose from, and there are three main things to consider when choosing an inverter. Output power, input voltage, and cost. Most inverters are designed to accept 12 or 24 volts DC. I chose a 24 volt inverter because higher voltage means less current for the same amount of power, allowing me to use lighter gauge wiring which is cheaper and easier to work with. Cost is another big factor. I went with a more expensive brand, mostly due to its reputation of having good customer service and that it comes with a 5 year warranty. Most of the Chinese inverters come with a 2 year warranty at best and likely no customer service. Also, the cheaper inverters tend to have modified sine wave output as opposed to pure sine wave output which could potentially damage some electronics. On my inverter panel, I'll also be installing two shunt resistors that can be used by the BMS to monitor the current being provided to the batteries from the charge controller and also the current from the batteries to the inverter. These are 500 microohm shunts, so 100 amps of current through these will generate a 50 millivolt signal. In addition to a fuse, I'll be installing a 300 amp circuit breaker between the battery pack and the inverter so that I can easily electrically disconnect the batteries without having to unscrew any terminals. Next, I will run the battery negative cable from the inverter to the battery and attach the line, neutral, and ground to the AC output of the inverter. Here I am just adding another circuit breaker between the battery and the charge controller and finishing up some final wiring. Time to put the battery pack into place and attach the battery cables and BMS. In order to distribute AC power throughout my lab, I will be making these pass-through junction boxes. My plan is to string three of these boxes under my workbenches, with each box having four outlets. Alright, so here's the moment of truth. Uh, batteries are at 98%. Gonna fire up the inverter. Sounds like it's coming up. Got power, got some lights. Got a few lights. Not all the lights are on. Oh, I gotta turn on my UPS. There's one. There we go. Got lights, got monitors. Wall displays coming up. See if my bench is coming up. Cool. Let's see how much current we're drawing. So, from the batteries, um, eight amps. It's not bad. It's only about maybe 250 watts or so. Looks like everything's working. Let's see if I can boot my PC. PC's coming up. Sweet. I think it's a success. My initial inspiration for this project came from wanting to have backup power for our small chest freezer where we store breast milk for our nine-month-old son. As you can see, I took things a little bit further than initially intended, but I'm super happy with how things turned out. I look forward to sharing updates on how this system performs over time and in different weather conditions. I'll be logging all of the data. I will no doubt be expanding this system, so expect a few more project videos involving solar and home energy storage on my channel. Please like and subscribe if you want to see more videos like these, and thanks for watching.